So, uh, my name is Nicholas Segura. Uh, I am a creative business professional here in Kansas City. And what I've been doing for the last 15 years is uh, helping companies develop Hispanic marketing, multicultural marketing uh, for their product, service, or organization. Um, I started about 15 years ago when I first started working at Dos Mundos Bilingual Newspaper. It's the largest uh, bilingual newspaper in the Kansas City area. And what I was doing was I was uh, helping them create um, ads and uh, campaigns and creative pieces for our corporate clients. You know, they, were, they had me go out and find large clients like Kansas City Royal, Sprint, Anheuser-Busch, Applebee's, uh, Worlds of Fun, things like that. And uh, inevitably, what was happening was I'd be reaching out to clients and say, hey, we should look at the Hispanic market, diversity. And uh, they say, Nicholas, we've got about $15,000, $20,000 for you to spend, uh, but we don't have any materials to create with it. I'm like, so we would create it. You know, when you work in the media, like the newspaper or the radio station or the television station, they'll generally create an ad for you almost for free um, so that you will buy the media placement. Uh, but what I was, when I went back to the newspaper, I said, why don't we create an agency that you know, we bill out and create this stuff because we're giving that uh, copywriting, that translation, that graphic design, that photography away. Why don't we create an agency that does this for them, um, even the consulting, uh, and help you know grow that uh, creatively? But they didn't want to do that, and so that's when I kind of went out on my own. So I've been doing this for about 15 years. And I've come across all kinds of crazy issues, all kinds of situations that um, have to make, make you think creatively uh, and uh, have to do deep dive and research. But enough about me. Let's talk about you. I'm curious, when you guys come to see a diversity presentation like this, what kind of uh, businesses do you come from or what kind of questions do you have? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, one of the speaking of uh, seeing more diversity in tech, one of the uh, other businesses that we started just a couple years ago is an organization called Lastema.org. And what that is, it's to connect uh, diverse uh, women to uh, careers in education in STEM. So we just had a conference just a couple weeks ago over at Kansas City, Kansas Community College, where we hosted a whole bunch of uh, professional diverse women who are in science, technology, engineering, math, advertising, and arts, all talking about their careers and how they got there to inspire other young students and professionals to consider going in there. Because it's like we th our, our thoughts were that in order for people to see or to consider those careers, they have to see people succeeding in those careers. And so it was a really positive, amazing uh, presentation. And the stories that we heard from those women who are in those careers, totally inspiring. Yeah. What else? What other kind of questions do you have? No? OK. All right. All right. All right. Cool. Well, let's just go. So the way I like to present this idea is I want you guys to imagine your ideal audience. That audience might be um, generally young, young people, younger because they have a longer uh, life to buy products or utilize your service. Uh, they might be, uh, let's see, uh, they might be early adopters of tech. So you can maybe capture them through social media or, uh, or, or the web or even email marketing, uh, they might be uh, growing really quickly, like, like their numbers, their population is growing. Um, their spending power might grow, uh, be growing as well. And when I talk about the ideal audience, when I step aside and I say, well, by the way, that's what's happening with the Hispanic audience here in the United States, inevitably, the numbers that I share with the clients that I work with are a big surprise to them. and They've never heard those numbers before. So we're going to be talking about that and uh, those numbers and how to potentially reach them online and utilize so social media. So basically what I'm trying to say is that the world is changing and I think that we all see that. We all see that how we're so much more interconnected. We see how things happen in different parts of the world more rapidly. We're, learn we're watching uh, online videos about stories about whether it's the ocean and pollution or wars or people who are just trying to succeed the world is changing and the demographics are changing because since the world is getting smaller through communications, people are able to communicate more broadly to a larger audience. 
but primarily here in, in, in the United States as well, this audience is changing dramatically. A lot of people don't know that over the last 10 years, over 50% of the uh, entire US population growth has been because of the Hispanic market every year. Over 50% every year has been because of the young Hispanic population. And that population is really young too. In fact, it's not only a big growth, but Forbes Business Magazine, I don't know if you guys ever watch or read Forbes Magazine, but a few years ago, back in 2012, they said that his, uh, Hispanics, while underserved by advertisers, will be the most important growth market through mid-century. So it's not just me. <laughs> it's Forbes Magazine, the most important growth market through mid-century. And yet, so many brands and organizations, companies, have yet to do anything about that or reach out to that audience. So let's talk about that. How important are they? Well, here within the borders of the United States, if you, had, if you just looked at the U.S. Hispanic market, the spending power that they have, we're the seventh largest economy in the world and we're growing by 50% yearly. So for example, um, the Sea league uh, economic report that came out a few years ago, they are saying that the spending power of the U.S. Hispanic mar market is growing by 50%. And, uh, and add to that that the population from the Census Bureau is growing by 167%. Average age, uh, 27, compared to the average age of the average Americans, which is, does anyone know what the average American is? It's 42. So minus 15 years, and you have the average age of Hispanics. So that, when you think about the person who's 42 and the one who's 27, they act differently, don't they? They get their media differently. They even have different ways of looking at the world because they're younger, so they grew up with uh, iPhones and iPads and technology. And so they adopt, adopt things a lot faster. Nielsen, which is where we get a lot of our reports from um, because they're so credible. Um, they said that if you're a business person, you really want to take a deep look at it because understanding the market represents a, your company's bottom line. So it's going to be really important for companies to consider that. When it comes to the Hispanic market though, the Hispanic market is so diverse. When, not too long ago, I was watching a, a Canelo uh, uh, Fight. Does anyone remember that fight with Canelo and who was it? Weather, Weathermaker? Mayweather. Mayweather, thank you, thank you. Was anyone surprised by Canelo when he walked out into the arena? Let me describe Canelo for you real quick. Canelo comes from Mexico and he had red hair, white skin, and freckles. He looked like a kid from Boston. You know, you know your ideal Bostonite, what they look like? And I was like, what is that? And then he only spoke Spanish. He, um, he sang the Mexican anthem and he couldn't, his interview was in Spanish and they had to translate it for him because he couldn't speak English. And it was a great fight. But me personally, even I was blown away. I was like, wow, there's such a diversity in that market. And when it comes to the marketing that we do, I think that, play, that that's, that's a really strong message because when it comes to creating imagery, uh, online, uh, uh, using uh, talent for television commercials, um, those images are very powerful. And one of the things that diverse and Hispanic audiences know is that they're very diverse. They have such a variety of different looks. And unfortunately, one of the businesses that we, one of the things that we do at, at, the, at the marketing firm is we represent talent. So we have a talent pool of African-American, Asian, Hispanic talent that uh, corporate clients and advertising agencies and uh, uh, production houses hire so that they can put them in their advertising pieces. But the unfortunate part that I found over the years is that they always hire the stereotype. They want someone that looks African-American and just looks African-American. Someone that um, looks Hispanic, all of skin, dark hair, uh, Asian and so forth. But the reality of the is that they look so different. There's not a stereotypical look for the Hispanic market anymore. It's really diverse. Luckily, in the last year or so, clients have been saying, hey, we need to find someone that's racially ambiguous. Someone that could be African-American, but Filipino, but Hispanic, maybe a little bit white, just a mix of everything. So that's where the, the direction's going, creatively speaking. But when it comes to the Hispanic audience, we're talking about 
Latinx, Puerto Rican, and this is where the big question marks start coming in. Generally, uh, clients will, uh, well, uh, generally clients will come in the door and they'll say, okay, here's our English marketing material. Make it Hispanic, and that's it. That's a really simple equation for them. But for us, we have to step back and we're like, okay, well, what type of audience are you trying to reach? And when you say reach the Hispanic audience, that's like saying, I want to reach the American audience. If I came to you and said, I got a product, I want to reach the American audience, what kind of questions would you ask me? Which audience? Huh? Um, how old? Yeah, how old? How old are you trying to reach? Yeah. What, else? Yeah. what else? What else would you try to reach? What? The region. The region. Where are you, are you, are we, is this product going to be in New York, Miami, LA, Midwest? What else might you ask? Education of the audience, okay. What else? Income, okay. Interests, what about sex, um, um, age group, uh, um, all those different basic things. And you've, when, you, when you figure out who that target audience, then you develop the creative material for that. Because well, you could be a, uh, his, uh, a nonprofit organization, you could be a tire company, you could be a diaper company. Each one of those is going to have a different audience. But just coming at it like we want to reach a Hispanic audience is just way too broad. So we've got to drill down with the client and say, okay, well, who are you trying to reach? And those the questions start coming in with, for example, Cuban, Puerto Rican, Cuban might be where you find, uh, where do you think Cuban might be at here in the United States? Florida. New York, Miami, those areas, they've got a certain way of talking. Uh, Puerto Rican might be in uh, like uh, uh, Miami again, yes, exactly. Uh, Hispanic. Latin American, Ecuadorian, Dominican, Mexican, there's all these different pieces. And what we've got to do is figure out where are you trying to go? Which audience are you trying to reach? And what's interesting about this is that when it comes to this experience of going through how to develop marketing material for that audience, um, I found this really, this really study very interesting in that uh, the dominating fact, she says that the dominating factor that unites minorities uh, is that their treatment is outsiders. And what's happening is when you consider the advertising industry as a whole, the advertising industry uh, has a real diversity deficit. In fact, the advertising industry as a whole is about 5% minority, 95% white. And yet they're creating all the advertising, the radio spots, uh, print ads, web, social, whatever the case may be. And so they oftentimes come to us and say, Nicholas, how do we do this? And that's why we consult with a lot of advertising agencies and marketing firms in the Midwest because they're still trying to figure out how to get into that market. When we get these questions, uh, the, we have to ask them, which market are you trying to reach? You know, the, like I said before, the average Hispanic born in the U.S. is about 27 years old. So that's pretty young. Now, when it comes to the average age of the first generation Hispanic here in the U.S., it's only 19. That's really young. And they're going to be bilingual, they're going to be bicultural, they're going to be able to go back and forth to the United States and uh, 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 or the outside world in their homes very easily. In fact, Yara Puente, she's one of our models right here, she, she explains to us that at home, she lives in a Mexican world. Her parents treat her like she was born in Mexico and you have to follow those rules. Um, but when she walks out the door, She's just living in the American world and like that. But she goes home, she goes back and forth, uses both languages, uh, and listens to all kinds of music and entertainment. Then, of course, you have those who are newly arrived, um, foreign born Mexican. And these numbers actually over here is actually kind of declining, as you've heard from um, immigration numbers. Those numbers are actually in decline. This number right here, right here in the middle, this young uh, first generation is really uh, rapidly growing. And that's changing the marketplace. As I said before, seventh largest economy in the world right here within the United States. So let's talk about some of the habits of these young multicultural people. Since they're so young, remember in 1927, they're over-indexing. Do you know what over-indexing means? The average general market is 41%. So 41% uh, uses a smartphone. Uh, 50, uh, Hispanics are doing it by uh, more than by 10%. Um, regularly text 47%, general market's only 42 
use mobile apps, 20% versus 14 for general market. So right here, you're already seeing that they're early adopters of technology. They're using this more. In fact, not too long ago, there's a great report on uh, Latino USA, and they're talking about the mobile phone and how students in Los Angeles, for example, were doing their entire homework. They're writing papers, research on their mobile phones. Can you guys imagine writing a, a, a five-page exam on a mobile phone? What students are doing it, and that's amazing. Okay. So, on offline shopping. So, everyone likes to shop, and we've got Amazon, that's a big deal. Using social networking sites to shop, 51% for Hispanics. They're over indexing by 20%. So, when you think about your product and where you're placing it, where you're placing your media, where you're placing your stories about your product line, if they're using social networking sites to shop, 51 uh, doing that for this audience is definitely something you want to consider. Reaching out to friends and family, uh, Hispanics 37% versus general market by 17%. So there's another jump in 20%. This comes from, by the way, um, uh, where did I say this came from? Leo Burnett up in New York City. That's a big, giant agency up there. Uh, digital media habits, uh, shopping via mobile phones. Mobile phones 56% versus 33% on the general market. Tablet 45, 25% uh, for the general market. So again, big leaps in numbers of 10 and 20%. So just a quick run through of facts. Uh, average age 27, population 50% uh, every year. Early adopters of tech, uh, they like to share and watch more videos online. In fact, in the last presentation, we were just talking about uh, videos and how important it is to utilize social media video. Well, guess what? These students, these young people, are watching and sharing more videos online by 68%. Um, of course, they shop, my land, shop online, and of course, they're single, bilingual, ready to mingle. <laughs> very, very social groups. Now, not too long ago, just last year in late 2017, Nielsen came up with a really large report. And this was just, this report was all focused on Latina 2.0 where I talked about the Latina consumer here in the United States. The biggest thing that I took from that was that the Latina consumer, in particular the fastest growing consumer group in, the, in America, is also outpacing the rest of the nation when it comes to social media use, cultural affinity, setting new standards for community, beauty, and style. And I think we've seen that. What, how have we seen beauty change in the last, let's say, five years? What have we seen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The original, like, I don't know, like old movie style, I guess. I don't know how to describe it. Like, I was watching a video. Yeah, I was just watching a video not too long ago where uh, a woman was talking about, she's an uh, African American woman, she was talking about teaching her young uh, girl, her young daughter, to uh, embrace her curly hair. And how when she, was, when she was young, she didn't do that. But now in 2018, she's like, you know, I'm, I'm going to like my hair and it's going to be okay. Yes, makeup lines are changing. In fact, Rihanna, can, I mean, girls talk about that line, like it's like a godsend. What's it called again? Fenty? Oh, goodness gracious, don't, don't mention that. They'll be like, we got, where can we get some? They want to get it right away, and that's fascinating. So those type of things, these, the, in fact, you could take uh, J-Lo, for example. I think while, while she, uh, she's had a huge impact on entertainment, beauty, curves, things like that, women uh, uh, um, uh, embracing themselves. So I think that they're, they're making a huge impact on that, that, that option. So earlier today, so I'm just going to give you some ideas on things that we do when it comes to uh, the clients that we work with. One of the um, just local clients that we work with, just to give you a quick example. Do you guys know Rainbow Car Wash right there on Rainbow Avenue? Okay, just a little plug from my clients. <laughs> well, you know, they, came, they approached us and they said, Nicholas, we want to reach more of the Hispanic audience because they're in Kansas City, Kansas, which, by the way, is 33% Hispanic. One in three over there are Hispanic consumers. They have an all Latino team in that car wash, and the owner said, we really want to do something that reaches out to them. 
So uh, one of the things that um, was just asked earlier over the lunch uh, was how do you do um, you know bilingual materials because or bilingual social because of course there are the translators on the uh, social media tools for example and um, and we what we did was we write those ourselves we write them uh, in English and then we write them in Spanish we write them in a way that's culturally relevant and we actually have a team pro tip number one. Google Translate is not the way to go. <laughs> now, we all laugh about that because we're like, yeah, of course. But there are so many companies who go to Google to translate something, an entire document. I'll give you a couple instances. One, where a company came to us and they were just trying to save as much money as possible. They had their English. And then they said, well, if we Google Translate the document for you and give you that, then you'll have less to translate. And I'm like, no, that's going to make more of a mess for us to translate, that'll make it harder. So just let us translate that thing for us. And we don't just do it, we don't just have one person do it. Because as, as you saw earlier before, there are um, different languages from different parts of different countries. You know, I, I'm, I made this deck pretty small because of course I can't teach everything in diversity and multicultural marketing in, in an hour. But incredibly, only in the United States is where you can take 22 different countries from south of the American border and send them all up and now they all become one group. That only happens here in the United States. Uh, fascinating. <laughs> but, um, but when it comes to developing this type of copy, uh, we, we make sure that we use a team to do this. We've got people who are born and raised in uh, the United States who speak uh, American Spanish, uh, people from Mexico who speak Mexican Spanish, um, and then of course other countries, for example, like um, Brazil, and of course Brazil, they speak Portuguese. And that's, that's also still a relevant uh, uh, language that's in the Latin Americas and has to deal with that type of language as well. But it takes a team to make that type of stuff happen uh, in order to make it relevant. And we literally have copywriting sessions where we will, there's a sentence and we'll debate on which word would best fit this use and this platform to reach that audience to make sure the message gets across right. So it takes a team. The other thing, like I mentioned earlier, we've got that large body of talent uh, that we represent. And we try to make them as diverse as possible. Because, you know, when it comes to Latinos, what does a Latino look like? What does Hispanic, what does African American look like? What does white look like anymore? Really, because we all look so different. So one of the things that we try to educate our clients about is how to uh, diversify the images. One of the things that I believe that, that, that research has found and some of our interviews has found is that diverse customers, consumers, are, very, are hypersensitive to the images they see. There was a study done uh, some time ago where they, it was a, a, a hair product ad and they had a blonde woman in the ad, you know, pretty and well, let's just say shampoo or something like that. And when they tested that, it reached white women. But when they used the minority woman in that same ad, it reached the white woman, African American women, Hispanic women, and Asian women. And if you're a product, don't you want to reach as many people as possible? So in order to do that, what we want to do is we always want to share um, a wide variety of different images. Another example, some time ago, I used to be a corporate trainer uh, down at DST downtown. And I remember uh, I was sitting there with my coworker, Shelly, and we got our, um, our dentist's our, our benefits package. And we're both kind of looking through the, 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 the brochure and the information. And I look at Shelly and I was like, there's not a single minority in this brochure, this marketing material. And Shelly was like, you know, I would have never thought that. I would have never seen that. And you know, oh, you brought that to my attention. But we are looking for to be looking for other faces and to be included in those campaigns. And when we don't, we uh, we we, we, we kind of notice that. Now at the same time, let me go on the other end of the spectrum where you can go all wrong with that. Do you guys remember that ad last summer for Pepsi? with Kendall Jenner. Yes. Yeah. Now everyone's like, oh my gosh, how could that have happened? But the reality is that when you think about marketing and advertising, there had to have been millions of dollars spent on that ad alone. 
Because a bunch of people said, I got a great idea. And we'll have Kid will do it. And we'll check off all the boxes. We'll gather African American, the LGBTQ, the Latinos. They've got all the different people in there. It's going to be perfect. But it, that was called off the air within a day, wasn't it? So what, what, the thing is that when you take, when you put Kindle in there, while it's a beautiful ad, um, when you throw the wrong person or the wrong element in that ad, it can go really wrong. And one of the things that we're going to do is that we're going to mention, um, as you're doing this, be sure that when you create something like that to test it in front of people, make sure you put it in front of a broad audience so they all look at it and give you some real feedback. Uh, if you're in a, if you're in a kind of like a, uh, a cocoon of like people of yes people to say oh that's great 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 uh, you could very and they're all the same people uh, it can very well go pr pretty bad Ooh, jumped ahead there all right so as I was mentioning um, translations of copy now I've, I've worked with a lot of different companies where um, they've asked us to translate their marketing material, for example. They want to reach that audience. And I'm asked them, well, what are you doing with that brochure afterwards? Well, we're going to put that in the lobby for everyone to use. Okay, are you going to tell anyone about that brochure? How are they going to learn about what the services that you offer? And oftentimes, and too often, uh, companies will say, uh, we translated it, but no one came. We translated our material. And I'm like, well, did that brochure just sit in your uh, lobby? And did you market that? Did you tell people that that was there? Did you tell people that your services? How did you do that? And that's really unfortunate because when people, when, when companies fail in their marketing attempts uh, without doing it right the first time, then they'll, they'll, they'll literally walk away from that audience saying, you know, they don't want our product. But they really didn't do the marketing very well to reach out to that audience. Also, uh, when it comes to, uh, and like I said earlier, uh, utilizing tools like Google Translate, uh, do, don't really take into account the cultural relevance or even um, how to uh, write some copy that might uh, utilize uh, cultural touch points. Whether it's African American uh, products or audiences you're trying to reach, or Hispanic or Asian, there are cultural touch points um, that can be used. I'll give you a quick example. I remember I was working with a gas company, Natural Gas. And uh, one of the, and, and they just wanted to market this and translate everything. And I was like, well, okay, translating it's going to be necessary, of course. But how are you going to sell that natural gas that you use in home? Uh, uh, and one of the does anyone does anyone have any does anyone remember using natural gas as a young person? What you might have used yeah, it for? Barrels? No, no, just like in in the oven, for example, use natural gas yeah, to. I mean, Yeah. And you just use like natural fire to heat your, uh, right, right. the food, right? Yeah. yeah. I remember when I was a kid, we used to use, um, um, we used to use, uh, uh, we had a natural flame in the, on the stove top and we would make our tortillas mm -hmm. using that. And like, we would never worried about getting burnt at all. You know, <laughs> and I was like, that would be so cool, like to have a Latina with, you know, uh, uh, making tortillas. Everyone remembers that, you know, when you're young, uh, your parents cooking for you. And that's how you're like, oh, natural gas. Yeah, I remember that. I want that back again versus like electric. So, you know, it's, it's little things like that cultural relevancy and touch points that can like really get people to absorb, um, embrace your product, your brand or your service. But you've got to think about that. Who the, well, again, I'm going to go back to the first step. Who's your target audience? When you think about that target audience, whether it's a father or a mom or children or parents or business people, you've got to think about how are you going to reach that audience? I've mentioned this already. Uh, Hispanics come in all different shades and, and styles. I would say, really, let's jump to number three. When you've, when you've considered all of your, your, your marketing, I tell people to really abandon everything they've heard. Let go. Everything that you've heard may not be true. You've got to go and do research. You've got to go to that audience, uh, test that product, test that message, make sure that it works really well. And test, test, test your message on the audience. And then track it. You know, when it comes to marketing communications, there's so many times where people just throw things out there and they're like, okay, we'll see if it works or not. And they just don't track it. They don't necessarily do that. And when you don't track it, you don't track your successes. And if you don't track your successes, you don't know if you really did well with that audience, if that works A and B testing or anything like that. So you definitely want to make sure that when you're doing this type of work, 
to be testing and, and checking the response rates of these different uh, marketing pieces as well. Ask experts for help, not Google. Uh, we were talking earlier uh, about uh, reaching out this audience, and you're saying, and you're the, in, uh, did I say you're saying that you're the one person in your team doing marketing. Who do you get to ask? My your coworkers. Okay, that's a start. Yeah, so you're getting, you're starting to uh, test and ask questions of the the people. Yeah. So. You, and do you guys debate different uh, ways of saying things and how to approach? Yeah, yeah, and, do, and eventually, eventually you find like the way that you all agree upon, right? And that takes the work, that takes the research, that takes the um, collective minds put together. So, um, so when it comes to reaching out to this audience, um, you know, you can go to Google um, and oftentimes I've heard people and uh, professionals in advertising say, Nicholas, everything you're telling me um, I can find on Google. Well, that's not necessarily true. You might have a product or a service uh, or an organization that you're trying to share with people. But if you just go to Google and, and do some information gathering, that's not going to tell you, that's not going to get you into the, uh, the finer nuances and points of like utilizing cultural um, um, uh, understanding and awareness that these new young audiences are uh, becoming. You know, when you, when you look at... Um, everything that's happening uh, in the world. I mean, take, uh, uh, I'm thinking of uh, Florida and the most recent uh, shooting and things like that. Such a diversity of people coming together to come up with ideas. But when it comes to uh, uh, different audiences, different locations, you know, people are different. P people in New York are very different from people in Kansas City. Florida, Los Angeles, uh, um, Portland, they act differently. So when you think about that, you've got to think about where where your audience is coming from and how to reach them. I remember years ago, uh, we did a uh, uh, the Applebee's first radio spots, and we we were just on the creative side, and it was early for them. But afterwards, they they told us that they had placed the ad the radio spot in uh, in Portland, Oregon. We're like, why would why why Portland, Oregon? There are not a lot of you know, Latino Spanish speakers up in Portland. But when we go back even further to that story, I remember the, the client came to us and they said, okay, um, we uh, want to reach a Hispanic audience. Um, here's our ad. We've got these, there's a bunch of guys that play basketball every day. And then, and after they get done, uh, or every week, then they go down to the local uh, Applebee's and they, you know, grab all the, the dollar, you know, the menu items and things like that. I'm like, well, that's an interesting story. They just want us to make it Spanish. I'm like, that's how relevant is that going to be? Because how many uh, uh, Hispanic NBA players do you guys know of? <laughs> now, why are you laughing? There's got to be one, right? Oh, yeah. But what would, what might be a more uh, a culturally relevant sport? Soccer. soccer, soccer, or what else? What else might be? What else might work? Baseball. Baseball. Yeah. Basketball. I was like, we've got to change some things. And so uh, it's it's even the tiniest things like that that if you don't stop and go just a little bit further to think about those different processes or uh, your audience or where that media is going to be placed. For example, if I know that that media is going to be placed in Los Angeles, I'm going to have much more of a Mexican sounding um, uh, speaker versus Miami uh, or Florida where it might be more Cuban or Puerto Rican. Dominican might be up in uh, New York City. But it all depends on those little fine details of what, what's happening. Okay, so what now? What do you guys do now with this little bit of information? So um, what I'd suggest, number one, Hispanic research into your own product, service, or organization. Uh, just doing some research into what is the audience we want to reach? Who's the target audience? Uh, so you were saying that uh, uh, you all run a nonprofit organization, right? Who's your target audience? Everyone that speaks Spanish? What about, I mean, are there English speaking? Okay, so it's mostly refugees. Okay. What are some other uh, businesses or products that are out there that you guys might be trying to reach? Okay, wow. You might be looking for um, customers and employees. Yeah, wow. Okay. Parents and school districts. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which school district are you with? 
Okay, cool. I'm from USD 500, Wyandotte County. USD 500, all right. Anything else? Groceries, wow, yeah, groceries. Groceries are huge. Hispanics over-index in groceries. They go to the grocery store more often. They buy more fresh foods there. They're major consumers at the gross in the grocery line. Um, not too long ago, we did some presentations in front of AWG, Association of Wholesale Grocers. Sorry, right. um, yeah, and uh, because they've got they've got um, private label brands like uh, Always Save and Best Choice. That was really hard because I mean, when you look at Always Save and Best Choice branding the labeling, you really can't do much there um, to change it. So, so we had to come up with something interesting that might uh, reach that audience without affecting design of the label and so what we did is we did in-store audio promotions so when you're in the grocery store you might hear uh, a story about a family who uh, uh, saves some money by sa buying the always save product versus the more expensive uh, private label brands yeah yeah so you know you've got sometimes you you run into all kinds of limitations when it comes to marketing. Uh, take the financial sector for example. There's I've, there that's a highly regulated uh, industry, and so you just can't go out and put copy out there you know, as you like. You've got to get it. It's very regulated on what you can say and where you can place it. So anything else? Any other products or services that are out there? Well, there's a lot because everything that you all buy everyone buys, whether it's computers, mobile phones, um, tires for your car, oils for your car, um, groceries, whatever the case may be, um, those things are being consumed by a really young, uh, fast-growing audience. And again, with a spending power growing by 50% in the last five years, I mean, imagine if you're, if you got, if you, got a, if you all uh, made 50% more money now than you did five years ago, you'd be pretty happy with that, wouldn't you? Yeah, so that, that audience is growing really fast and young and, and spending a lot of money. So um, another thing to do is review your marketing material. Does it, does it reflect diversity? Again, like I said before when I was telling you that story about the uh, Dennis uh, brochure, make sure that, that look, at, look at it and, and just kind of give it another set of eyes and see, do we, do we, are we inclusive here? Do we, do we show a variety of different people? Um, there's sometimes when I get a lot of uh, bank, bank marketing materials and I see the one type of consumer all the way through the brochure, and I'm like, wow, there's not any diversity in there whatsoever. And, and, and I'll take, I'm gonna flip it as well. If I just see um, brown faces or uh, Hispanic faces, all I'm still like, there's no diversity there. It just can't be ethnic faces. It's gotta, we're in America. We, we're, we're all kinds of people here. So it just can't be one type. It's, it's really, you can go too far with that. There was a, not too long ago, we were doing a video for a, a bank, a local bank, and, um, and uh, they brought in all of their Hispanic and African American um, uh, uh, executives to be in this video in this roundtable meeting. And I was like, this is not good. There's, where, where, you know, where's the rest of the team at? We, this doesn't normally happen. And, uh, but, uh, and so we had to like stop everything. Like, we need to get a little bit more diversity in here. Oh, well, we thought this was diversity. We went, mm. That would come off fake to me. That would come off fake to you. And I, ex Exactly. This is not real. Yeah. So that's the other thing. Uh, ask if there's a plan. If not, start one. You know, if, 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 there's, if, there's, if no one's thinking about this stuff or no one planning on it, because this, this audience is growing tremendously, um, we should start one now. Um, and, then, uh, and then start working on uh, just, you know, getting some different eyes on that. But start a plan now. And review some do, and review some do's and don'ts of Hispanic marketing. We've kind of gone through that. We'll put that slide deck out there. Now, one thing I want to share with you all: um, I get a lot of reports uh, from Nielsen and different banks and um, um, Association of Hispanic Advertising Agencies. Um, ad was it ad 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 week? Thank you. Uh, and so when we get those things, um, I'm always happy to share those documents with people. Um, they usually come in every year from different organizations. But if you like, contact me after uh, the presentation or online or on Twitter, uh, and I'll be happy to email you some of those documents that are a little bit more relevant for your particular industry. So be happy to do that. And uh, this where that's the company that we work with, and uh, uh, you can find me there. You can just find me on, on, on uh, Twitter as uh, Nicholas Sigur as well. It's all one word. So thank you guys for coming. Is, what are the, is there any other questions I can answer for you before we wrap up? Yes. Um, so if you, if I have um, on Facebook, I have somebody um, um, 
asking a question. Mm -hmm. In Spanish, I mean, I can kind of Google that and see kind of what they're asking. Yeah. I cannot respond to that. Yeah. I, I mean, what? What's the best way to handle that? You know, I would just, if, if based on your limitations, I would probably just respond back in English. English. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of uh, companies and organizations, their biggest fear is that we can't do anything with that audience yet because we don't have Spanish speakers on staff, and that literally stops everything. <laughs> I'm like, number one, we, why don't we develop the marketing material? And as we're developing the material, you guys can be um, looking for diverse bilingual employees as well. But in your case, since you might be a small business owner, um, you're, uh, one thing that I tell um, these organizations is that the majority of people who read this are bilingual, the majority of them. You know, that audience of just Spanish speakers, um, there's, that's small. But not only that, but Spanish speakers have generally have someone right there next to them who can read that and tell them what it means. So I wouldn't I wouldn't be fearful of that at all. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. That's a great story. Just trying. Yeah, you know, I mean, I don't know if you, I don't know how many uh, if you guys speak any languages or anything like that. I, I I try to pick up a little bit of every single language. You know, I mean, for example, I remember in college I learned Konnichiwa, watashi no namae wa Niko desu, which is hello, my name is Nicholas in Japanese. And when I run into a person from Japan and I get to use that, or if I use some Farsi or some Arabic, man, they, they're like, wow, that's cool. So you're right, absolutely, just trying, just trying uh, can make a huge difference. And people know that if you don't speak their language, you know, you, that's, that's just the way it is. But if you make a tiny little effort, they're like, at least you made a tiny effort, and that can make a big impact. Patience, yeah. Mm-hmm, yeah. I'll give you a good example. With yeah. One yeah, I understand. I mean, it's you know when you're always constrained by budgets and, and team members, that's always a, the biggest challenge. Um, but I'll wrap up with this final story. Um, not too long ago, um, I remember uh, I was I was watching I was at a an event, a, a nonprofit event down on the street where they had different booths, and there was a person running for running for a political office, and what. When I will start looking through their materials, um, I notice things something right away. Sometimes when you use those Google Translator docu those translators, they don't necessarily put all the accents that you utilize in those things. So, if you can imagine someone saying that they had 12 uh, uh, years experience uh, in doing so and so and this and that, and it, well, I'm getting some smiles. <laughs> what are you thinking? What do you think happened? Uh huh. What do you think happened? And when you miss the tilde over años, what happens to that? It's not what you want. It's a completely different thing. I'll let you guys look that up. What años is versus años. 
but those are the things that can happen when you uh, when you utilize those tools because they don't necessarily put the right uh, accent marks on it. And just the, that little that little squiggly line changes things from years to something very unpleasant, <laughs> very unpleasant. Anyway, thanks you guys for coming in. I appreciate it. Thanks for being a great audience and interacting with me. If you guys want to just uh, ask me questions afterwards, I'm always happy to ha help and ask, answer questions and just share some stories from experience that we've had in the past. So thank you very much. Hope you have a great WordPress uh, day.